Okay, so you're welcome back after a coffee and hopefully all our online um, attendees are also back with us now. So our next session is about strategies in practice and take, getting uh, a view from out actually at the research phase or at the farm phase as to wh what's happening. I'm going to cut short the introductions of people because um, in, in the interest of time. Our, our next speaker is Nicholas Gengler. He's from the University of Liege and he's Professor for Numerical Genetics, Genomics and Modelling in the Terra Research and, Tri and Teaching Centre, as I said, of Un University of Liege, Gembleau, the agrobiotech, um, agrobiotech in Gembleau in Belgium. So, um, Nicholas, if it's okay, I leave your introduction at that. There's a, a lot more of achievements and, 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 and so on, acknowledgements, but uh, we'll just say you're a very famous uh, uh, person and you're here to talk to us about the potential for animal genetics to uh, contribute to uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. So over to you, Nicholas. Thank you, thank you very much. I hope I get this done with the system. So again, thank you for the invitation. I will try to speak about genetics, what I mentioned as being a very useful tool. It's a challenge to be up to the talks before. Very clear, very interesting. I hope mine is also into Oh, wrong this, wrong direction. What did I do? Uh, OK, now, now what's going on? OK. I think I have found now the. No, it doesn't work. Ah, okay, okay, sorry. It was a small green work when I was pushing. Anyway, so but obviously, genetic improvement as a promising tool. It was already said, so I will not do anything else as saying that we have at least three reasons to do this, to say this. We have low costs, well, low in the sense that you can choose what to make, so that's low cost. It's permanent in the sense that you are generating something that is kept by the animals, and it's cumulative, what's really nice. Additive effects are cumulative, so you're, ac you're basically accumulating good genes or good alleles, to say it more, more correctly, here. But to do genetic improvement, to create genetic improvement, we need to create breeding programs or a breeding program. Obviously, there are different production systems. That's not the talk of today. What I'm speaking about is more dairy cattle, often, but not only. And what is the first point to say is point two here on my list is the breeding goal. So what is a breeding goal? A breeding goal is what we want to achieve by breeding. It's made quite obvious. It's also more technically a function of traits we want to improve. I insist on the point we want to improve the traits. So these are traits, they are giving, we're giving an emphasis, weights, if you like, and then we are calling them breeding goal traits. Obviously, we will do this now, and also, I would say, then several years already, to do it in a direction that, we is, that makes sense for humanity, for sustainability, for a lot of things, for climate change, or climate mitigation. And so we basically come here to the point that it's crucial to do this correctly, having what we call here this uh, canon bear, whatever we call it, of different important issues we have to address. Obviously, as you see below, we have also reduction of uh, impact. And to get with improvement of uh, greenhouse gases, we do we need to develop appropriate selection indexes and also keeping the breeding balance. We should not imbalance it by adding new traits. We have to be very careful here too. Okay, to make breeding, we need phenotypes. Even genomics needs phenotypes. Very important. Very very important. Now, phenotypes is obviously very nasty for GHG, and I insist here on CH4 and also NTU, so nitrogen oxys. Why? Because I think both are already considered here as being of big importance. The last one especially not often considered, but I consider it. And there are different ways to do it. Well, difficult to measure indeed, but we can link it to the animal and its efficiency. So we can basically try to make, uh, say, Inform, get information about feeding, well, obviously energy is then related to CH4, maybe also nitrogen use efficiency, then we basically have to make much more, compli even more complicated measurements on animals. And as you see, direct animals, uh, dire, dire, uh, indirect uh, measures to work on efficiency are not so easy. And direct measurement of CH4, neither. So NTU, uh, NTU, NTU, I don't speak because anyway, we don't measure it directly, at least not on an animal directly. 
a complex disease pneumonia. On measuring NSCH4, and here I will not go to the detail of the slide because you can look it up later in the publication or in, uh, directly in the uh, slides that we will uh, say uh, make available uh, later. And you see here that we have a lot of lows here and problems here, medium here. That means basically it's very difficult to find a direct management that is easy, cost efficient, you can explain, you can do it in, in large large data sets, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a lot of different things that are not so easy to, to do here. So keeping the more in mind that measuring directly CH4 is a challenge. And expensive. So we have maybe here a little bit of a help by doing going back to selection index. So instead of directly taking the trade we want to improve, we can come up with trades that are in getting information to the system, information that we can then use as a predictor, I call it linear to be more technically, uh, BLP is called in technical terms, uh, of, of the breeding goal. So we try to predict the breeding goal. We can even be a little bit more intelligent by doing it and creating what we call a desired gain selection index. So it basically means we are forcing the response, obviously of what? Of greenhouse gases, obviously, to be in the good direction. And by doing this, we are tweaking around the system so we can up, up with a better resp response. We have an example later. Anyway, what's important is this conception of selection index trade is very important and it's basically what we can really measure and really select on. Obviously, we weight them to technical terms to get some index value, and we rank animal based, animals based on this value. So now, important is that the breeding goal traits and selection index traits are not the same. So we have two, 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 two groups of traits, and this group of traits are very interesting in this context because I already spoke about CH4, the problem to get it, and for NTO, N2O, we have even it's generated outside of the animal. So basically, we have here even a bigger problem. <laughs> but we have maybe some proxies, proxies for CH4 emissions, for nitrogen use efficiency. And here I will speak about milk composition because it's my field of research and I, where I'm competent in. I will not pretend to speak about things I don't know. And so we have the advantage that we can generate tens of millions of records. And uh, I will explain how to do it. But obviously, in general, there's a strong interest to create proxies, but it's a very important problem. We, have, we need international collaboration and much more work on this topic. I will use here the infrared um, analysis of milk. What is interesting, because we do it by standard, we have it. This data is generated hundred millions of times uh, on everywhere in the world on this famous machine, spectrometers. And if you get access to the spectra, so basically to the absorbance values for different wave numbers by getting this, the information through milk, uh, using a Fourier transform, but that's again technical stuff, I don't explain it, we get some absorbances, so we get the spectra, and the spectra gives us a possibility to calibrate, to, to infer basically existing novel traits, and the novel traits can be on the uh, uh, CH4 and, and nitrogen huge efficiency, as I just explained before. Now, this was already shown by different groups. Uh, sorry for putting my papers from my group, but other groups were also working on it, so don't pretend to be the only one. But we are doing quite a lot of stuff on it. And what is important is that this works very ni nicely. Obviously, you don't predict directly the direct trade, so you don't get the direct trade. You don't predict it with 100% accuracy, if you call the term accuracy, it's not a very good term, but anyway. But you are predicting it with a correlation good enough, genetic correlation good enough to use it as an uh, indicator trade, as a selection index trade in our index. And good news, because beef cattle will, or sheep or whatever, will, will maybe complain, we don't have milk, what should we do? There are new technologies appearing, and again, I stay in the infrared level, and hey, I should really say that the CRAW in Jean Blue is my, my colleagues across the road, are really the big, big experts in this field, and we are using, or they are using, we're collaborating a lot, so we can say we are using near infrared uh, directly on feces, and that can obviously be done with many ruminants and not only with dairy cows. And it seems to work quite nicely. There was a talk at uh, EAP on this. 
So, next point, routine breeding. Routine breeding needs, we, we know, to show if animals are good or bad. We know to, to, to generate breeding values, the breeding values being genetic potential of the animal put in a certain perspective. Okay, can we do it? Well, first we need to be sure we have genetic covariation, and this variation is heritable. We have variation that is heritable means genetic variation, and there indeed for the proxies I just mentioned, we have heritability in a range from 0 0.10 to 20. What is not huge, but it's similar to somatic cell, so it is used as an indicator trait, also an indicator trait for mastitis. And it's even interesting because at that range we know we can do something, so there is potential. Okay, now as you see here, now comes routine. You say that was my topic, I'm not speaking about it. Yeah, I start. Why I'm starting? Because first disclaimer, I'm quite sure what I'm saying now is, is wrong or already outdated because it's really moving fast in the last months. It was very interesting to hear New Zealand and so on. I heard three, four years, okay, not yet. But others are, fresh, are going very, very fast. And uh, already since a certain time, some countries have been using uh, efficiency um, traits. And maybe New Zealand is missing in my list, but anyway, because New Zealand is a, pro, is, is a forerunner for many things. Ne uh, the Netherlands, Australia, USA, I know, more or less in routine, more or less. Direct is a little bit, indirect, even infrared, is a little bit more a really moving target. I could add Belgium, but unfortunately we have a little bit um, accumulated some, 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 some delays, but anyway. Can Canada has been uh, going very quickly. Ireland has now an, a carbon sub-index uh, for uh, ICBF, as, so, uh, it, I think in October, in a few days, goes, it comes out. Anyway, I'm not totally sure what is exactly inside, but I think it's in direction more of the carbon footprint. It's not directly, I see ICBF is nothing, okay. So I'm, I'm not totally wrong by putting it in a question mark. Anyway, now NTO, N2O, N2O, N2O uh, well basically is uh, a little bit urea, maybe a proxy, some doubts, uh, and some of my I have a student, PhD student, working on this, and he found really some doubts about it. Anyway, again, we need collaboration, and very, very, very important. Something I didn't mention directly: collaboration is not ex is also necessary when we are using a, a normal, a new tool. What is genomics? And genomics is a tool of high interest. But to make good genomics, we need good reference populations. We need exchange, collaboration, that's really the, the magic word. Okay, now, should this work? Well, here I have a colleague of mine, so Oscar, presenting this at the AT ATF EAP 2022 event, already mentioned, and what it is showed. You see the blue line current, that's in the sense that we have already, when you're expressing it in, in terms of relative terms, a certain positive trend. I say re relative terms, it's important, because animals become already more efficient by the selection, the breeding we are doing. But then you have the brown line, maybe not a nice color, but it is good color because it's what is possible. And you see the brown line is quite strong. And you see when you go a little bit more in detail, again, go to the paper, you will see that this is in the direction of this uh, desired gain. This desired gain approach is really a very nice and very useful approach. And uh, Oscar showed this also by comparing the current uh, index in Spain, when something where we have a price on carbon, that's, uh, that's a yellow-orange uh, field here, and then we have the blue, uh, what is the desired gain? 20% reduction in the next uh, uh, 10 years, I think, yeah, it was 10 years, I'm no longer sure. Anyway, so, uh, and then, for well, 20 years, it was 20 years. Well, anyway, it's not very important. What is important is it works. It works, we just saw it. And another thing what is important is it is economically, you see the, the, ah, the roundel, it economically a little bit less interesting, obviously. We, we lose something, but we, lose, we gain in recognition by society on the long term good things for the future, and I think that's a good point about it. We should breed for 
the future breed for society also and not for the very short term profit that is obviously and social, I think, importance of the farmers. So we have take home messages, obviously. My first, I have already said it. There are many approaches, but genetics seems to be an excellent tool. I will not ex explain again why. I think, I think, I hope I was clear. Also, we need practical implementation. <laughs> genetics lives about dissemination. Gen genetics lives about creating progress. And real progress, you see Austria's simulations are not yet there, so we need really to go further here. And it's first, the first progress in the field. But what is really a problem, a key issue, is international collaboration. This meeting data is really nasty. It's expensive. It's very difficult to get. We need to work together. We really work together. And we need also to work together. Genomic selection is not replacing collaboration for getting good phenotypes. Phenotypes are always required. And I would even say this, this, uh, what is needed is also some supportive international collaboration. And I've tried some time ago to put forward a pro proposal for an interreg about methane collaboration. It's very difficult to, try to find the good support schemes on a European level for this type of, of collaborative work. Thank you very much for your attention. And obviously, great thanks to my sponsors. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nicholas, for an excellent presentation. And uh, the take-home message I have from it is that there is uh, progress being made uh, on tr true animal breeding. We've just time for one question, if we have one. Uh, we'll take, Sinead, you got in the last time. We'll take the, you have one, Anna, have you? Yes. Please go have, ahead. But we have two. One. <laughs> um, I, I, um, yeah, I have a problem. <laughs> choosing one but I think Bill if you agree we can take the the second one and uh, Nicola will answer you in the chat because it's more technical I mean I can do both uh, but I think the second one is better for the policy oh, environment that we have so regarding the New Zealand emissions reduction target and especially the biogenic methane reduction of 24 to 47 below uh, 2017 levels by 2050, could you evaluate the potential, so the proportion, of genetics to achieve this target? It's a big question. Yeah, that's what... It's a big question, and I think we come back to the desired gain. This desired gain approach is very nice because we can obviously put the gain very high and trying to achieve the target. I say try, I'm not sure it works, because it depends on genetic parameters, I don't know, obviously. but. It is, I think, possible, but you have a trade-off. You have a trade-off at different levels. I didn't mention it at not the time because there's a trade-off also to health and a trade-off to a lot of things. We have to keep our, uh, our breeding balance. So we cannot push everything in this direction and have afterwards animals that are so efficient they are, they, are, they are sick, but also not efficient. Okay, thank you. Okay, Nicholas, we'll leave it there. Hopefully you'll be staying around and we can, we can chat to you later. Our next presentation um, is by Sinead Waters. Sinead uh, is a colleague of mine, and again, like Nicholas being very famous, Sinead is very famous as well. I won't say much more about you, uh, Sinead. You're um, a researcher, uh, researching particularly the role of the rumen microbiome in um, improving nutrient utilization of feed and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And as well as a, a research scientist in Chagask, you're chair of the Livestock Research Group of the Global Research Alliance for Agriculture and you're a member of the expert group on methane, the European Commission's expert group on methane. So you're going to talk about feed additives, uh, thanks, Sinead, Frank. in 15 minutes. Yeah, I'll, I'll be quick. Um, thanks, Frank, for the very nice uh, introduction. Uh, and it's great to be here. Uh, and thanks to the, the ATF for the, for the very nice invitation to speak here today about feed additives. So what I'm going to speak about is really our experience in Ireland and to give you all an update on the progress and, of course, the challenges that we're facing in relation to feed additives. Uh, and as part of that, I'd like to acknowledge the contribution of my co-author here, Dr. Lawrence Chalou from Chagas War Park, who's got, who really has contributed on the dairy grazing side to this presentation. So just by way of an introduction, and Michelle really covered this very well, methane we know is a potent greenhouse gas. And agriculture in Ireland is responsible for 37% of our greenhouse gas emissions, which is quite large. Methane is responsible for 70%. Now, that's a really large number when you comp compare it to other countries, particularly in the EU, 
of Irish, uh, methane is responsible for 70% of Irish green, agri greenhouse gas emissions, and that's the latest figure is from the EPA in Ireland. And of that 70%, Enteric fermentation, or the digestion of feed in the rumen of animals, is responsible for 62%. And another area, which is probably more low-hanging fruit for us in terms of mitigation, would be the stored slurries and manure. And they really are responsible for about 8%. In Ireland, we are committed, you would see this in, our, in the media, uh, and everywhere we're committed to reducing our emissions, uh, legally binding, by 25% by 2030, under the Climate Action and Low Carbon Development Bill. And that came into force really by the end of last year. And as part of that, we really will have to reduce methane emissions by about 10%. So how are we going to do that? Now, a lot of my previous speakers touched on a lot of this, so I won't linger on it. The main thing we're focusing on at the moment in Ireland is enhancing the efficiency of the production system. And that would include things, that's part of our Chagas Mac, and that's really going to help us to get maybe a third of the way there. Part of that will be the reducing the age of slaughter, grassland management, because we can produce significantly lower methane emissions in pasture-based settings. And as the previous speaker said, we also need to have a, a it's not going to be a one-prong approach for us in Ireland, it's going to be multi-pronged. We're going to include breeding strategies, which is well on the way uh, between Chagas and the collaboration with the Irish Cattle Breeding Federation, or the ICBF. Yeah? Okay, no problem. Okay, no problem. Uh, so I just need to see this. I can see the slides here. Perfect. Okay, I see these here. Thanks. Perfect. So the breeding strategies, as my previous speaker, this previous speaker spoke about, uh, are really important for us, and we see these as a long-term strategy that's going on in the background. And I'm also involved in that work, and we are measuring methane emissions on large numbers of animals in the last, say, five to six years in Ireland using green feed systems. We have a very nice setup with the Irish Cattle Breeding Federation um, in Tully, the performance testing station in County Kildare, where we're going to have breeding uh, targets using direct methane as well as the carbon footprint. But that's going on in the background. And what I'm going to talk about today is really going to be our, our progress uh, in the area of feed additives and the challenges that comes with that, particularly in relation uh, to the fact that we are very much a pasture-based country. We're very much dependent uh, on our, our grass, we can have a climate to grow green grass very efficiently and cheaply, and it's our main source of feed in Ireland. So we don't want to jeopardise that. So we need to develop feed additives that can be applied in grazing production systems. So in Chagask, we have really boosted our capacity to measure methane emissions, both indoors and, of course, outdoors. And here is the, some of the work in Chagask Moor Park, led by Dr. Lawrence Chalou and his team, uh, where they were measuring methane emissions on pasture. And really they found, and this is another area where we could achieve some mitigation, where we found that comparing the calculated versus the measured uh, methane emissions on pasture was, was a lot lower than the calculated using the emission factors. So these emission factors that are devised by the IPCC are developed based on multi-country uh, emission factors. Um, and they are but in Ireland, we produce a lot of our cattle on pasture, and these, looking at a grazing season, uh, Lawrence took into account the whole grazing season, uh, and looked, there was, a, there was a significantly less methane produced. What this will tell us is that we really need to develop country-specific emission factors, uh, particularly at pasture, for cows and other, other animals at grass in Ireland. So that's just one area we're working on, and that creates a baseline then for our mitigation strategies. So in terms then of international reports, just to preface what I'm going to talk about today, there's been a number of international reports. The first one that was actually uh, coordinated by the NZAGRC in New Zealand uh, and CCAFs, and basically supported by the GRA, which as, as Frank mentioned, I'm the co-chair of, of the uh, LRG. And this was led by Dr. Roger Hegarty. And they found by looking at what, he did a very wide ranging review of the literature that existed and found that out of everything that was out there, that there's really nothing available at the moment that we can apply. However, the most promising feed additives that delivered mitigation at the level of 20% included Beauvais, our 3NOP, uh, and Asparagopsis taxiformers, or the red seaweed, which everyone would have heard about. And nitrate could de de deliver a 10% mitigation. However, there are constraints that he identified, particularly in relation to grazing systems, there's nothing really available for extensive grazing systems, and also the use of a lot of these studies depended on the TMR diet or indoor continuous feeding. And then a recent report, by, but which is in review currently by the TAG, uh, the FAO LEAP, uh, they also uh, 
basically came up with the conclusion that basically from a review paper that came from one of those chapters led by Karen Boschman, that basically more research is required uh, in the area of feed additives to deliver mitigation um, in grazing systems. So this is two really concluding remarks from two major international reports. So in terms of feed additives, we have what do we, well, we must have consistent mitigation reduction. Uh, we must have a mechanism of delivery, and I'm going to talk about that in the presentation. We must be capable of counting the mitigation and get credit for the mitigation in our national inventories, our country-specific inventories. And we need to be no food safety or residue issues, so we're working on that also, and no negative performance. So we would like to have enhanced performance and palatability of the feed additive, but we certainly cannot have any negative performance. Desirable, we would like this feed additive to have low cost, uh, to have increased performance benefits, uh, a natural origin, now that could be difficult, uh, consistent, considering it has to be very specific, and a potential for combination with each other for synergy, and of course with the other mitigation strategies I spoke about earlier. So we have a project in Ireland I'm going to talk about that I'm leading called Metabate, and really this project aims to develop novel farm-ready technologies to, to bring about mitigation. Uh, and this project is funded by our ministry, our Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marines, and started in 2020. And the aim of the project really is to evaluate a large range of feed additives and looking at their production performance. And some of these that we're evaluating include bovair, um, seaweeds, and seaweed extracts, oils, and a range of seaweeds. One of these we developed through the project, which is a novel, uh, basically an oxidizing methane inhibitor, which changes the oxidative reduction in the rumen, which makes it less conducive uh, to methane production. And I'm gonna talk about the success of that additive and where we're at with it in terms of its progress in the presentation. We also are working at developing slow release options at pasture, uh, also looking at, um, at manures and slurry and additives because that's another very important source of methane. And then looking at the nutrition and the toxicity to ensure there's no residues, that is consumer safety, uh, and there's actually no effect, negative effect on meat or milk products. Uh, and of course, life cycle analysis and cost effectiveness. And they're the key things. So we're taking a very strategic approach, starting in the laboratory, being very cognizant of the three R's approach that we're not utilizing animals unless they, these are promising feed additives. So we have in our, in our lab in Chagosk, we have a Russi Tech system, which is an artificial ruminant essentially in the lab where we can test very quickly some of these feed additives. And we've tested really everything that's on the market out there and from ones that we're developing ourselves. And we're looking at them at different concentrations and different kinds of, of levels. And two points I'll make here, so these are some of the promising ones. We found that the oxidizing methane inhibitors, uh, which is under the trade name Room and Gloss, or RG in the rest of the presentation, these really brought about significant uh, changes in, in, in reducing methane emissions. And these are mild peroxide kind of solutions that change the redox potential of the rumen. Generally, urea, uh, hydrogen peroxide, or calcium peroxide type products. One point I'll make here, we tested um, our Asparagopsis taxiformis, the red seaweed, and we had two different sources, ones that were harvested in autumn and one at summer, and then we, we, we found different results. So we went on to test the bromoform within those uh, uh, taxiformis, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, Asparagopsis, the red seaweed, and found different levels. And the point I'd like to make here is that this shows the inconsistency of the red seaweed product. It's also, it decays over time, and really this would be an issue for delivery, in my opinion, uh, of red seaweed as a mitigation uh, feed additive. It's also extremely costly for us in Ireland, we don't grow it naturally. Another point, we, we, we see differences here in the brown seaweed, and this was because of our inclusion rate differences. So the point I'd like to make is the Rossi Tech helped us to basically fine tune levels and, and different sources of feed additives. We also had the opportunity in collaboration with DSM to test uh, the three knot product uh, and look at the efficacy in growing beef cattle. We did that last year uh, and basically the, in terms of the details of the trial, we used a TMR diet. We had a climatization period of four weeks and a trial period of 12 weeks and we used dairy beef cross animals that were about six months of age at the start of the experiment. And we measured dry matter intake, methane output and daily live weight gain. And just to give you an idea of some of the results, this was a very successful uh, trial in terms of showing the levels of mitigation of 3-NOP. 
uh, and we found no effect on dry matter intake, average daily gain, or feed efficiency. The methane data throughout the trial was reduced methane by 25 30%. And you can see here some of the, in terms of the, the different metrics of methane, or different calculations of methane, you can see grams per day uh, reduced it by 28%. Uh, in terms of that, based on dry matter intake, about 25% roughly, uh, and based on intensity or body weight, uh, about minus 27%. And as a result as well, the hydrogen increased in the rumen, as you would expect. It wasn't utilised. Um, and then just looking at how effective it was, you can see here, during the covariate period, the methane emissions stayed between the control animals, they stayed very consistent. Once the feed additive was fed, the methane dropped immediately like a switch. And then at the end of the trial, in a residual phase, the methane then uh, increased again. So it's very much, it was continuously fed in an indoor system. We then carried on a number of beef trials in Grange as well to evaluate some of the other feed additives that we're developing and that were promising in the Rossi Tech system. Again, I won't go into it in detail in the interest of time. We had dairy beef bulls, we had a, a Callan Gates for feed intake and the green feed system for measuring methane. We had a, a seven day covariate period 70-day experimental period, and we also kept a seven-day residual effect. This time, what was different, because we have to think of the farmer, and we can't some, always continuously feed, so we fed the feed additives twice a day, uh, morning and evening, and the diet was a 60-40 forage concentrate-based diet with a barley coarse TMR, with the additive included. We did two experiments. The first looked at linseed oil and the brown seaweed Ascophyllum nodosum, and the, and, the, and the extract of that, of that seaweed. The second trial looked at these oxidizing methane inhibitors, which I call RG, or rumen gloss, gloss being the Irish word for green. So this is a, a new product. Uh, and we looked at levels, the low and a high, and then we were able to pellet, which was a really good advancement within this project, that we could actually put the feed additive into a pellet, and we tested that. And I didn't present some of the work here, but we did a lot of the fine tuning of the palatability and the levels of inclusion using fistulated animals, which were available to us in Chagas, which really helped us. So just looking at the results, we found that the brown seaweed, and this would really be consistent with, with international reports, uh, only tended to reduce methane emissions by about 4%. A seaweed extract, which was a type of fermented seaweed, uh, reduced it only by 7%, um, but no effect on, uh, on methane yield or intensity. Linseed oil reduced by about 18%, um, but we did see some negativity in terms of the dry matter intake in the linseed oil supplemented animals. We found a reduction in intake um, and, a, and a reduction of 17% in average daily gain. We also though saw, which was interesting, that some of these feed additives, even when the feed additive was taken away in the seven day period after the trial, uh, that the actual mitigation quite stayed consistent, particularly with the linseed oil, it was still giving us levels of about 14% mitigation at, after day six, So, which was, which was interesting. It had more long lasting effects. Looking at the, the, the rumen gloss or the oxidizing methane inhibitor that we're developing through this project, um, this, compared to the unsupplemented diet, reduced methane emissions by about 30% in the high level. Now, this was in a powder format. However, feed intake was reduced again, and we did encounter some palatability issues. So this was just too high, essentially, in that powder format. The second level, the half that dosage, reduced methane emissions by 18%. Uh, and it did increase weight gain by 18%, which was excellent uh, um, to see. Um, and the pellet, which really we're interested in here, and this is exactly what it looks like, we just took this photo last week, um, this reduced methane emissions by 28%. And it had no negative effect on intake, and it had improved uh, uh, weight gain. And we did look at the hydrogen, and that was, that was also lowered. So basically that hydrogen has been used. So we're really interested now to look at volatile fatty acids and the microbiome to look at the mechanism of action. So the advantages of this is that with the pellet, we can feed it twice a day in a nut. So what's our, our, our current and future work? Uh, my colleagues in, in Chagas Moor Park are looking at the same kind of feed additives in dairy production systems, and they're finding that they, have, they feed twice a day when the dairy cows come into the parlour and find that there is a lack of persistency uh, in the effect. So they get a really good effect. So the feed additives are effective, but they doesn't have a long-term effect. The effect is gone after three hours. And that really tells us that we need to develop new formulations for extensive or grazing systems. 
We're also looking at the mechanism of action. We're very interested in that. We need to make sure that we have look at, at how it's working in the rumen. Uh, we're doing sensory and, uh, and residue analysis. We're also looking at cost-effective analysis. We're working with the economists. Uh, and we're looking at delivery on farm. And that's going to be a key point. I'll just mention very, very quickly, we're also looking at additives for, for slurry and manure, uh, particularly one that the same company uh, is developing called Gas Abate, and that's having great success in terms of reducing methane emissions in pilot studies uh, up to about 70 to 80 percent over a 23-day day period, and this research is ongoing as part of Methabate as well in terms of slurries and manures. So how are we going to meet our GHG targets in Ireland, we have a good plan in place. We have a roadmap developed. The first thing we're going to, to, to do is look at the low-hanging fruit in terms of improving efficiency on farm. And we're going to do this hand in hand with an excellent program we have in Ireland called the Signpost Program, working with advisors and extension personnel on the farm and industry partners to bring about these changes. And things like feed analysis will come into play around 2025 as part of that plan. Take home messages for this include methane, as Michelle outlined and everybody else before me, is a potent agricultural greenhouse gas that we need to reduce. Uh, we're under national and international commitments to significantly reduce uh, biogenic methane. We have some promising feed additives, it's not all doom and gloom. We have this 3NOP was successful, uh, some of these new novel feed additives, uh, and we can get them into a pellet form. And we found that you know, some of the, the limited effectiveness of things that are really hyped, like, like seaweeds, um, also, we're really working hard to try and develop uh, slow-release um, um, feed additives for grazing systems. Uh, and of course, effective additives are available also for manure and slurry that need to be part um, of the plan. I'll just very quickly mention, as wearing my GRA hat, that we have a very nice GRA flagship on feed additives that's just started, led by David Giannis Roos in Spain uh, and Andre Bannock in Wageningen. And they, these are basically bringing about a, a flag. They want everybody to work on this internationally, that we can put all our efforts, similar to the last speaker, the take home messages, we need to work together in an international global approach to find solutions for different types of systems um, across the world. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge our really wonderful team that we have um, in Chagask and with the universities um, in Ireland. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Sinead. Again, a really excellent presentation. And again, I suppose, shown that there is uh, potential not too far on the horizon uh, in relation to, to feed additives. Again, just time for one question. Um, in, in, in the interest of keeping some way on time, uh, question up here at the front of the room. Um, My Michael Lee from Harper Adams in the UK. Sinead, excellent summary um, and really interesting about the room and glass product. Yeah. You used uh, the basal diet of a 60-40 forage concentrate mix. So what was the room and pH? So the room and pH, we haven't, we, the trial is still ongoing and we're, we're, we, ha we haven't looked at that, but it hasn't been very different actually between the concentrate and the uh, control. We did expect a difference. So from the first, um, for the first sampling procedure, we didn't really see huge differences. So it's the radox potential um, is, is changed, but they're mild peroxide inhibitors. They're actually food grade. So there's, there's, they're, they're actually very safe to eat, to eat and for the feed and they're palatable. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Sinead. I'm sure we'll be hearing more about RGs and room and glasses over the next uh, few years. Uh, we'll move on now, and our next presentation is from a remote presenter, uh, Thomas Duffy. Thomas, are you online? I am, yeah. Very good. So, Thomas is a, a farmer from Ireland. Again, I'm not going to do a long introduction here, Thomas. Um, you're a farmer from Ireland. Uh, you're, w w one of the hats you wear is that you're Vice President of CJA, the Council of Europe for Young Farmers. And I guess we have you here today representing young farmers. And um, in Ireland, uh, you were very involved in the, the young farmer organisation called Mochran Affirma, and that included a, a, a time on the, the, count, on the board of the board, but also, very importantly, uh, you were President of Mochran Affirma in Ireland. So look, you're a, a dairy farmer, and I leave it to you now, Thomas, to take the floor and outline your um, your practices around reducing greenhouse gas emissions on your farm. Thank you. Super, thanks very much. Uh, I'll just get the presentation up there. Yep, perfect. 
uh, apologies. Um, okay, so uh, unfortunately I can't be with you uh, today. We're actually out in Brussels again um, on, on Monday and Tuesday for another CJ meeting. So as, as said, um, I am a vice president of CJ and uh, in between uh, running around the place, I occasionally get to, to go home and uh, manage firms. So um, I suppose uh, talking about the acceleration of the uptake of greenhouse gas reduction measures, there's been a, a number of really excellent presentations. I might just go to the next slide. Um, there's been a number of uh, really excellent presentations today, but I suppose I'd be focusing more on the uh, both the policy aspect and, and actually getting implementation on some of the roadblocks that, uh, as a farmer, implementing some of these uh, we could potentially run into. And there's one significant one that we'll highlight. So uh, I suppose just uh, very quickly overview of, of what we're doing here on, on our farm. I won't dwell on it too much. Um, as uh, Sinead mentioned in the last um, presentation, uh, we have the MAC curve in Ireland. Uh, at this stage, I think I've come to virtually the end of, of all the measures on it. We've implemented 100% protected urea. Um, we, we just went with the uh, P and K as straights instead of using 18612. Uh, it was just easier from a nutrient management point of view. Uh, we are using 100% uh, sex semen to breed uh, replacement heifers, which is a bit of a challenge on a, uh, an Irish uh, spring calving system where we're trying to keep calvings tight, but uh, we're happy enough with where we are at the moment. Um, emissions uh, from slurry, particularly ammonia, has, has been reduced by uh, using low emission slurry spreading. Uh, focus on the EBI, which would be the Dairy Breeding Index in Ireland. Um, I'm very interested to see what's coming with the uh, carbon, um, the new one that's, that's just been launched, uh, seeing where we fit on that. Um, the sward that we are grazing is, is almost entirely a, a clover grass-based system, and, and we've managed to reduce nitrogen uh, on the farm uh, quite significantly over a number of years, more substantially, and another cut this year again with uh, the, the price of it. Um, we are trialling uh, some, I suppose, innovative stuff uh, around multi-species swords and red clover silages. Um, and uh, in terms of that, I suppose, we're finding the first practical kind of uh, barrier that was, I know those practical barriers were mentioned with the red clover silage, um, no real issue, uh, good establishment, different management, which can be a bit challenging for us, um, but on the whole, uh, quite a straightforward mix. Multi-species swords by comparison, um, in terms of establishment, excellent. In terms of growth, really positive. Unfortunately, weed control is a major issue uh, um, for us. And I know another, uh, a number of other farmers that are struggling with the exact same uh, issue. So it's just a kind of an example of a really, really excellent, um, I suppose, uh, practice that can be implemented to reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions and, and particularly reduce nitrogen. But again, where the rubber hits the road can be a bit of an issue. Uh, in progress, uh, always, uh, we're trying to breed more kgs of um, uh, milk solids per kg of body weight. Um, in some cases, this is crossbreeding. In other cases, it's focusing on high EBI uh, Frisian cows. Um, more multi-species swords, uh, particularly on the drought-prone areas of our farm to, I suppose, as a climate change adaptation. Uh, red clover silage, we'll be implementing another, I think it's seven acres of that. Uh, and the potential for IVF to improve beef uh, progeny is, is an innovative thing that we're kind of working on at the moment, or we're not necessarily working on, but I know there's some interesting trials, so we're interested to get involved in that when that becomes uh, maybe commercially viable. Uh, so next uh, slide there. Uh, so as I say, in terms of the, the trade-offs, in terms of emissions, and, and Sinead has highlighted a number of low-hanging fruit, so uh, I suppose that would be the first column here, you know, changes to fertilizer is a very straightforward method. Uh, improved uh, utilization of N, uh, soil pH, improved beef value of dairy beef progeny. Uh, landscape features in Ireland, we have quite a number of hedgerows uh, as uh, field boundaries, but our management of that is often not great, uh, particularly on dairy farms. Um, data capture, so again, the milk recording or the cattle weighing and culling, uh, lowest performings. Um, I suppose the, the issue here, we've, we've quite a successful um, central kind of collection uh, and distribution in, in ICBF, our Irish Cattle Breeding uh, Federation, uh, which is a good example of data sharing in Ireland. But I do think uh, more can be done, uh, particularly in this area between maybe the, um, particularly in the beef sector um, with uh, kill out data. Um, increased longevity of cows and, and uh, reduced involuntary culling again, really that's just health improvement um, and focus on that. Smaller changes investment needed here is where you begin to get into a few trade-offs. Um, so sex semen, you need really good 
uh, heat management, um, biological end fixation, integration of clover. Um, two issues that have come up with that so far. Firstly, low growth rates in spring, um, particularly on heavier, wetter soils. Um, and then again, the establishment of clover uh, from a weed management point of view. But again, those who are farming in Ireland on quite heavy, either heavy clay soils or um, on organic matter soils, um, in terms of the temperature that that uh, what you call legumes require to get grown. Uh, precision farming again. This is an uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, this is a, an investment requirement. Tolerance of weeds, uh, minimum tillage, and grass arable systems. Uh, bigger and costlier ones. Uh, the area of uh, renewable energy, solar panels. Uh, we've increased grant aid for that in Ireland now, but I would say Ireland we're still a little bit behind other countries, particularly France, maybe a little bit ahead of us in this. Uh, ponds or rewetting organic soils. Uh, very challenging how we manage that. Um, first and foremost, we're taking land out of production ultimately. Um, although if it's targeted, uh, I think it can yield a huge benefit. We are looking at one pond on our farm already. Uh, this is more of an ecology measure, though. Uh, rewetting of organic soils, I think the concern very much there is the uh, potential trade-offs with others. Uh, biomethane, obviously, a very large capital investment, floating covers or, or storage upgrade. We can move on to the, the next set. Yeah. Um, so again, here we have, I suppose, a, a, yeah, I, I would be remiss not to focus on this as, as the president, CJ and former president of uh, Machina Firma. Uh, there is an age gap when it comes to um, our acceptance of climate change. Um, there is, unfortunately, I would say, a, a deficit, a real knowledge gap. It's an under-resourced area as to the attitudes of young farmers specifically. There is a few pieces of work, but they're fairly limited. Um, we do know that in terms of the general age demographic, um, the, you know, consistently climate change is the top priority for those age 15 to 35. So you would expect uh, the farming population to broadly reflect that as well. Uh, and from my experience, uh, level of acceptance of climate change and need to do something about it, uh, in particularly reduce greenhouse gas emissions is far higher in the younger population. Um, but that's anecdotal until we have its... Uh, um, Substantiated, uh, similarly, about 88% of US young farmers attribute climate change and weather patterns, which is higher than what you would uh, perceive in the older generations. As I say, it's, it's an under-researched area. Um, unfortunately, I, I suppose I have to be clear about this uh, from a senior point of view, there is a lack of uh, focus on the youth dimension in policy when it comes to climate change. Um, we're quite disappointed with the lack of mention in the Farm to Fork document, only a single mention of youth, and that was in reference to the potential for organic uh, in, increase in organic area to increase the number of young farmers, which is a is an extremely unsubstantiated claim, to be honest to make, uh, because uh, that's more of a correlation than it is causation. Um, so as I say, across uh, the other thing, uh, um, Milford uh, et al. in 2021 showed that basically as, as general acceptance of climate change is increasing, uh, the five-year cohort is, is very, very clear that that's increasing substantially. So the, the next slide. Yeah, so a, a disconnect, as I say, between policy on generation and renewal and climate change. Um, we do know uh, a number of different areas, so particularly young farmers are more likely to be highly educated. Uh, they're more likely to have received a third-level education. Uh, they're more likely, and those who are um, more likely to have received a third-level education are more likely to engage with things like workshops and discussion groups and more likely to seek out research bodies uh, to really get their information. So the chances of them uptaking uh, or being early uptakers of new technologies is quite a bit higher um, than when we look across the age demographics. So as I say, uh, again, while we, we are in the, the lack of research on this, uh, using, using that as a proxy is fairly clear in terms of engagement in extension services uh, and in terms of knowledge transfer, that, that young farmers are more likely to engage in those. And they're more likely to implement those policies. Um, counter, of course, uh, argument would, to this is that young farmers are often trying to make a viable livestock or uh, income from their, their livestock. So they may increase their uh, their livestock uh, stocking rates, so they may increase their fertilizer usage. So it's also very important that we actually do target these in terms of policy and in terms of knowledge transfer, uh, not least because you know, if we can mitigate that, we would have a very significant impact on growing greenhouse gas emissions. But also if we can implement practice change early on in someone's career that is going to be practicing for another 40 years versus uh, someone who might only be practicing for another 20 years. 
Um, and in, in general, of course, there's always the anecdotal that, you know, uh, young people are more likely to take up new practices. They're slightly more welcoming to it. Uh, but again, uh, there's very little uh, direct evidence of that in um, young farmers, though it is a widely, uh, you know, expressed experience of those who are working in extension service. Uh, next slide. So, as I say, uh, the conclusions on this, uh, a lack of policy consistency uh, and then baking in and really overlooking the social pillar, um, because young farmers are often put in the social pillar, I might argue that they should be in the environment or the economic economic pillar of sustainability, uh, but there is a, a lack of focus in this in terms of the social aspect, um, missed optimization of financial investments in, in implementing measures on young farmers, uh, farms, uh, potential need for tailored approach to schemes and extension work, um, and a greater potential return from investment if generational renewal is uh, ensured. So uh, thank you very much. It was delightful to, to be here and, and to be asked to, to speak today. Thank you very much, Thomas, uh, for a really good presentation, very clear, uh, outlining what you're doing, but in particular, I suppose, putting forward the, the, the dimension um, from a young farmers of young farmers in, in this debate. Any questions for, for Thomas? Can I ask you one, so, Thomas? Um, yep. you, you've nearly gone as far as you can go in terms of implementing measures that are available to you now. This is on your own farm. Uh, the next tranche of measures might be feed additives. Would you use feed additives on your farm if they were available? Yeah, um, and I know there's been a, a lot of discussion around uh, economics of that. Um, for me, as long as it was cost negative, uh, or sorry, not cost negative, cost neutral, um, yeah, uh, I would, because the motivation here for me would be uh, if we don't reduce methane through feed additives, ultimately it will lead to a reduction in, in herd numbers, which will affect my farm. Uh, there aren't two, two ways around it. I know some other farmers have expressed a desire that they would like to be, you know, compensated for it. Personally, I think that's a bit of a short term uh, view of it, um, given the pressures that could come on the sector. Uh, again, as long as they are practical, uh, we are actually in, in the process of moving towards robotic milking. Uh, so certainly listening about pelleting um, and potentially being able to feed three times a day to have a, an effective use would be would be quite good for us. Uh, but I think ultimately slow release, potentially bolus mechanisms or others that are being worked on uh, might be more effective for the, the grass based sector. OK, so look, um, I guess the, the main point I'm taking for your answer is your openness to trying technologies like that is is um, is quite high. So look, we'll move on, I think. We have one more speaker before we go to the panel discussion. And, and thanks again, Thomas, for that. Our last speaker is Simon Bonnet. And Simon is an agricultural engineer and human nutritionist. So you're a double act. And uh, you've always worked in the food chain and how to transform it through the development of healthier and more environmentally friendly, friendly products um, through innovation, nutrition, or marketing of with different agri-food companies. You've been more than 10 years with the Bell Group. And the Bell Group's mission is to implement the transform and transformation and transition towards a more sustainable dairy upstream, according to the Global Charter, co-constructed and co-signed with the WWF in 2018. And you're going to tell us today your exp the experiences of the Bell Group uh, in this uh, topic. Exactly. Thanks a lot for the invitation from ATF. Uh, maybe the first question is why a cheese company is going to speak about methane today. Uh, so we are producing the laughing cow cheese, baby bell cheese, and it's not a a topic we are usually communicate, communicating about, at least uh, with consumers. Uh, so just big green. Um, so just a few words about Bell. Uh, our mission is to champion healthier and responsible food for all. Uh, so responsibility and profitability at the same time, because we are a, a French family uh, company still. And uh, that's why decarbonation today is part of uh, our performance. So everything we, knew, we do, we need to be able to, to show that we are going to reduce our carbon impact. And so that's why in, in February of this year, the Bell Group announced that uh, it is strengthening its uh, carbon reduction target uh, to help uh, to limit uh, global warming to below 1.5 degrees. And we are the only uh, dairy company uh, with this kind of commitments. 
And what does it mean? It means it involves a net reduction of one quarter for greenhouse gas emission on our full value chain by 2035. So full value chain, it means what is happening in our factory, but also what is happening with our ecosystem, with our suppliers and with our customers. And so if we have a look to the bell carbon footprint, so it's their data of uh, 2020, today it's about 5 billion tons of uh, carbon dioxide equivalent per year. Only 4% is coming from our factory. So we can act directly only on 4% of the greenhouse uh, gas uh, emission of our full value chain. And we can see that two thirds is coming from the raw material. So at Bell, we are purchasing raw milk, but also butter, cheeses, milk powder, apples, fruits, and so on. And two thirds is coming from, uh, uh, from the farm. So that's why at Bell, milk is really at the heart of our decarbonation strategy. Just a few words, we are operating in nine countries. It's about 1.2 billion liters of milk we are collecting every year. Uh, and we are collaborating with more than 1,400 farmers. Okay? And this 1.2 billion million liters, it represents 1.4 million tons of CO2 emitted every year. So, sorry, CO2 equivalent emitted every year. And how we know that? It's because in the last three years, we have performed more than 900 carbon diagnostics at the farm. So our milk, uh, Bell Milk Advisor, are going to the farm to perform a carbon diagnostic. Okay? And so if we come back to our commitment to uh, our reduction, net reduction of uh, 20%, it means at farm level for us, we need, we need to reduce by 50% the intensity of carbon of the milk which are producing at the farm level. And so, how we do? So we perform carbon diagnostic, and now we are, it is well known, we are clear about the emission factor at the farm level. So on the left of the screen, you have uh, the theoretical emission factor uh, given by the FAO. On the right, it's one example of a French farm, uh, the results done uh, in March. What we can see, you have a small part coming from energy use, mainly to uh, call the, the milk. A, a small part also about manual management, and the two biggest parts are about feeding animal production and anti-fermentation. And so we can see that more or less 40% of the greenhouse gas at the farm level is coming from the fermenting, uh, uh, enteric fermentation, sorry. And if we come back to the full value chain of Bell, if we come back to the uh, full global carbon footprint for Bell, today we can say that it's about 25,000 tons of methane every year emitted at farm level for Bell. And it represents for Bell one third of the greenhouse gas emission. That's huge. That's why we need to work on that. So we work on, 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 on methane reduction, we will see, but also we already started on many other actions before. So we started in 2017, we are in 2022, and in five years we, are, we were able to reduce by 8% the carbon footprint of the milk. By action about the earth management, by action about reducing energy consumption at the farm level, by action about optimization of the ration of the cow, optimization of, uh, so we were speaking about grazing before, we are very present in, in, in Azores, it's like Ireland and New Zealand, it's uh, grazing uh, all year long, uh, and also by action uh, putting in place regenerative, uh, agriculture, uh, regenerative agriculture practices in US and, 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 and France. But what about antique methane uh, mitigation, which is one third of Bell uh, carbon footprint? So I think I, I've seen it uh, just uh, before also, so we are using the same source, it's good, <laughs> it's a good sign. Uh, we, we did a, a review of what uh, can be used today, so we have many solutions on the paper, but at least for the industry, very few are ready to use for us and for the farmer. 
we want to have no negative impact on farm management and animals, and for us, on milk quantity and quality. We need to have something scientifically proven and recognized by public authorities. We need to be able to monitor it because we are measuring our carbon footprint. So if we are going to invest on something, we need to see the impact on our uh, carbon footprint. And we need to assess the business model. Is it worth it or not? So that's why we decided uh, to go for a partnership with uh, DSM about uh, to test the three NOP. So they branded it uh, Bovair. It's much better, at least uh, for the consumers. Um, and so we have a clear formula. We know which quantity of methane we can reduce according to the Bovair doses, according to the quality of the uh, ration of the cow. And we know how to monitor it because today Bovair is recognized by the Cool Farm tool, which is one of the tools we are using uh, to do a carbon diagnostic at farm level. And so we decided to put in place two trials. The first one was performed in Slovakia and the second one will be performed in France uh, in two weeks. The objective it was not to see if we reduce methane. We know it's working. It's really to put the additive on the real life of the farm. So the farmer cannot change, change anything of this management. And we will see if it is feasible, if we have a good acceptance from the farmer to use the additive, and if we have impact on the milk quality and quantity for us. So the first results were, were uh, very positive in Slovakia. We have no impact on milk quality quantity, no impact on farm management, very good acceptance from the farmers. And as you can see, on the first farm, we assess that we can reduce by six tons of methane per year uh, on a full year, uh, the, the methane reduction, and on the second farm, eight tons. So it's a huge progress for us. And we will have so the second trial in France. It will start first week of uh, December. We are in partnership with IDEL, so Benoit Rouillet here uh, is in, uh, in the room and we are working very closely together. And the idea is also it's the same objective, to see if it is feasible and if it is well accepted by the, consumer, by the farmer. Sorry. And after, we are going to publish, to make public all the results of the uh, trial in France. And today, we made an estimation if we roll out Bovair everywhere in Europe, we could reduce the methane production of Bell by 4,000 tons of methane. It means a reduction of 16% uh, less methane per year, which is quite huge for us. So, so far, what we need to keep in mind? We have seen it, it's very easy to implement. We have uh, instant result. There is no drawback for the farmer so far. And even it could push the farmer to better know the quality of the ration because Bovair is linked to the uh, ration quality, so it's quite good. But we have still many challenges to face with if we want to roll out. The dose of Bovair is based on feed quality, so you need to know very well the uh, quality of your silage, for example. In, Slovak in Slovakia, during the uh, during the trial, we, we have seen that the farmer is not so confident with the analysis, uh, the quality of uh, the silage. You, know, you need to have feed analysis. It's, cost, it's costly, so it's more money from the farmer. There is no, be, no benefit beyond methane today with Bovair. So it means 100% additional cost for the farmer. So the big question is who is going to pay for it? Tomorrow, the farmer will be able to generate carbon credit with it and to sell it on the carbon credit market, question. Is the dairy industry who is going to be able to valorize it? Do the governments want to push for it with incentive? Do the consumers want to pay for it? Just internal data, we will say. 
we reduce by 4,000 tons of uh, methane. And to reduce by 4,000 tons, it means an additional cost of 5 million euros. So it's not neutral in terms of cost today. So my uh, take-home message, of course, we have Bovair, we have Additive, but it's not the unique solution. When you think at farm level, each farm is different, each farm is unique. You have a portfolio of solutions to reduce uh, greenhouse gas at farm level. And so you need to pick the good one to reduce the CO2 of the farm. And to my opinion, low milk, low carbon milk is not a fantasy. <laughs> it's just a long term transformation journey for the whole value chain. And each stakeholder of the value chain needs to take its part. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. That was a very interesting outline of, of what you're doing in the, the Bell Group and, and very innovative and very forward thinking. Well done on that. Again, we'll take one question if we have one over here in the audience. Thank you. Um, my name is Andreas Jennett from the Joint Research Center. I'm quite interested in your practice. Um, I saw that you quoted also a CCAFS uh, paper um, on a similar um, aspect. Um, did you also look into certification whether um, the footprint on, can be labeled on the products? So for the consumers? Yeah. So uh, we are looking at it, at least to see if the consumer is interested in it first, which is today in Europe it's not the case because it's linked to a too uh, high price. And so today the consumer are really looking for a low price. Uh, and in terms of certification, we are working also uh, with uh, French authorities to be able to, to have a official certification about uh, low carbon farms and uh, to be able to uh, uh, claim it on, on the packaging of our product. Yes. Okay. So thank you very much, Simon. And uh, again, hopefully you'll be able to stay around over lunch. and We'll be able to, to chat to you uh, then. So we're going to move now to the final part of our, um, of our seminar this morning, and that's the panel discussion. And we're welcoming back uh, John Roach and Michelle Kane online, uh, I think. John and Michelle, are you with us? I am, Frank. Good man, John. Yeah, you Thank me? you. And Michelle? Yeah. Yeah. Great stuff. Okay. <laughs> so, sorry. Okay, and we're have, we have another person, we're wel we'll also welcome online in a minute Pablo Manzano, but I want to uh, make a welcome to uh, Wolfgang Bortzler. We're very pleased, uh, Wolfgang, that you're able to join us this morning. Uh, Wolfgang is Director General of DG Agriculture and Rural Development, and um, you're an Austrian citizen, and uh, you have a, a long history of both of, of service in Austria and in the EU. I'm not going to go through it all, Wolfgang, but... Uh, here in Brussels, as well as being DG, Director General of DG Agriculture and Rural Development, you also spent uh, uh, 11 years as Deputy Director General in, uh, in DG Research and Innovation. So you have a, a wide history here, or a wide experience here in Brussels. Um, and uh, just, I, w I won't read it all out, but you know, you have a, a doctorate in law, and in a previous life, you were a university lecturer in public, international, and European law at the University of Innsbruck. So you have a, a, a great base of experience. And Wolfgang, if you'd like to come up and uh, join me here on the panel. And um, the other person that we're welcoming to the panel now is again a remote uh, participant. That's Pablo Manzano. And Pablo's uh, PhD is on rangeland ecology. And um, you've developed a mixed career in research and international development across many uh, countries, uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Govina, you've worked at the Spanish Agency for International Conservation, uh, Nairobi, um, Food and Agriculture Organization, so I, at University of Helsinki. So again, you have a, um, you have a broad uh, career or experience, Pablo. You're currently at the Basque Centre for Climate Change, and um, you, your, I suppose, interest is in developing transdisciplinary research on sustainability of rural societies and grazed ecosystems. So you're very welcome uh, also, Pablo. Can you just confirm that you're with us? Thank you, yes, I'm here. 
That's great. So now I'm in the happy position that I can hand over the management of this panel discussion to the two vice presidents of the Animal Task Force, uh, Anna Santos and Anna Gra Granada. So I can sit back and... Yes. Thank you, Frank. So, yeah. Our job is to, you know, with the rest of the time that we have, that we discuss what we were talking about this morning. Um, uh, maybe, I don't know, Bovkan, do you want to have some initial yes, remarks? <laughs> I think it would be interesting. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And I must say it's <coughs> really always fascinating to be with you in the Animal Task Force because it's so interesting to see the, the topics you are dealing with and, and how relevant they are for policy making. So I really uh, enjoy to be with you. The topic is, <coughs> as you know, of huge relevance still today. I just give you a flavor. So those of you who are looking at European Union and Commission business have seen that next year we are supposed to come forward with a framework law on sustainable food systems. So we are not talking anymore about agriculture and answers. Food systems is the key word. Holistic approach to food systems. And this is right so because I think, uh, as we have seen uh, also from the presentation of the colleague from Bell, it's about the whole value chain that has to be uh, uh, addressed. Now, <coughs> some of you and many of, you, of those who are not here, are starting now lobbying. We receive letters and papers and opinions and advice. And I give you just a flavor of two papers I have recently received, and I do not quote the authors. So, we are talking about a sustainable food system law, and we receive now the expectations of what stakeholders, interest groups expect to be in this sustainable food system law. So one stakeholder or one organization expects that in this food system law there is a provision that says European livestock should be reduced by 50%. First, uh, Article 1. The other one comes with the message Promotion for meat should be prohibited in a sustainable food system law. Just to give you a flavor of the multitude of opinions and requests which are out there. So this is one side. And why I'm fascinated when I'm here, because I see all the efforts that are going on and still need to go on and need to be intensified to ensure that also livestock production uh, can be um, done in a manner that it is at least more sustainable. The point I've always made when I'm with you, and this is not to please you, but I'm strongly convinced about it, if it's about livestock, it's more than methane production and possible cardiovascular and, and, and cancer-related diseases. This is a fair point, and we need to address them. But there is much more in livestock. There are so many positive externalities in livestock, which I think we should not ignore. So I think the challenge which we have to face is, how can we pursue this, this avenue to, to make livestock uh, more sustainable? And I think in the few presentations I've seen, there are, there are extremely pertinent questions. Firstly, are the technologies ready to be deployed on large scale? You have raised this question. It is on paper. What is the potential to be deployed on a huge large scale? The colleague from Ireland has shown what the Irish government is doing that in that respect. So I think really... <laughs> A key question is, what is the toolbox out there that is ready, ready to be deployed? 
And, 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 and who takes stock of these things? Because don't forget now, all governments are drawing up funding schemes for the implementation of the next common agricultural policy, where you have eco schemes, where you have agro-environmental measures, where all these points or these measures or these, these actions or these uh, could be subject to financial incentives to be used. So the question is, where do we stand in all this? And I think to have a, a clear view, are we ready, are we not ready, where are we ready, what are the pros and cons? The second thing you have raised is extremely pertinent question also. Who is in the lead to roll it out? Is it we, through the common agricultural policy, by providing incentives for funding schemes that promote these kind of things? But again, what assurance do I have that member states, governments, farming ministers, agricultural ministers offer these opportunities to their farmers? I, I would not like to go through all the strategic plans which we have received now to find out what is there in, in terms of funding schemes for the practices that you have just singled out. Second question you have raised, if incentives are not working, you have to employ regulatory framework. Regulatory framework, which means, okay, if you do not voluntarily, if, if it is proven that feed additives have a positive effect, you do not want to reduce the herd for the reasons that uh, Thomas Duffy has sent out, then the question arises, Incentives do not work. Do I need to come with a regulatory framework forcing farmers to do these kind of things? So <clears throat> I think these questions are, are, are all out there. They are very pertinent. And uh, again, I would like to thank you for, for, for having these discussions and for advancing in, in, in these in this, uh, issues, on these issues. Thank you, Wolfgang. It's always very sharp and putting more discussion on the table. Uh, we would open the discussion. Are there any comments, questions from the, the audience and also online? We will try to put them forward. Okay, Morten Hetta from Sweden here. I would like to go on from the previous speaker saying there is much more than methane when it comes to livestock. And one question I have is that why do we always focus on this question and I think that we have to realize that there is quite little methane in the atmosphere. There is only two ppm methane and when it comes to the emissions of livestock we are very good in quantifying the sources. When it comes to other sources we have much larger uncertainties. How much methane is emitted from wetlands, how much methane is emitted from landfills that we have much less accurate figures. So is there a risk that there we are misleading ourselves and the public by focusing too much on this actually trace gas in the atmosphere? That is my question. I, th I think this would be also for the online uh, speakers that... Yeah, okay, they're coming. Okay. So Michelle or John maybe? Or Thomas? <laughs> I, can, um, I can respond first. Um, if you can hear, hopefully you can hear me. Um, so when we look at the different sources of methane of emissions, it's true that they're very diverse. Um, it's not simply fossil fuels, CO2 being a much more straightforward link. Um, what we do know is that despite the uncertainties, we do have quite a good handle on what's going on in the atmosphere and what's going on um, from different sectors and it, it, agricultural emissions globally have been increasing um, and we can if we can and it, it's not it's not the case that methane just because it's a trace gas it doesn't mean it has a small impact you see it's caused half a degree of global warming and that is just from the anthropogenic sources okay so it's caused half a degree of warming to date compared to uh, an 1850 to 1900 baseline and uh, as a comparison CO2 has um, 
cause maybe about three quarters of a degree. So it is, it is a very large impact. And if we can reduce those emissions of methane, and it doesn't have to be, as I was saying before, it doesn't have to be down to net zero. It can just be um, if, you know, if we reduce methane emissions by um, you know, a few percent per year, something like this, and um, we can get some tangible benefits and you would actually realize um, detectable levels of, um, you know, lo lower levels of methane uh, warming in the atmosphere within um, a couple of decades. Uh, Pablo, you raised your hand, or you wanted to react? Pablo. You are mute. We cannot hear you. Sorry, sorry for that. Uh, I uh, raised my hand, but for the for the whole session, not for these concrete questions. So, if there is another panelist that would wish to complement the response by Michelle, I would be happy to give the floor and then talk later. Okay. So, is there any other question? No, at the moment. Maybe I, I would I would ask. Um, I don't know if a question or a remark to Wolfgang. So you, you referred, you know, the amount, the huge amount of <laughs> requests and information that you're getting because of, you know, of the sustainable food systems um, law or um, how, how, and we've been talking the whole morning and, and I think it was the first panelist that uh, spoke that um, science is needed in the debate. <laughs> So, how uh, effective is science being on the debate? Um, just on, on the question that you have raised uh, about methane and, and its, its effects, this is really a, a, a point on which I cannot pronounce myself. I rely on, on multiple research that indicates that methane emissions uh, constitute uh, risks for our uh, for our climate, and consequently we have to reduce it. So this is this is the starting point, which 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 I have not questioned. If there is other evidence, or I think if there is an issue that others pollute even more, all this is 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 a fair point, but it does not uh, reduce your obligation to contribute to the to, to a reduction of. Of, of methane emissions if this is a, a risk to our, to our climate. But again, there are many people, I understand, who are looking into this issue of what methane uh, 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 is and is not. I think the, the question of science, and the few examples which we have seen, uh, uh, shows how important it is to, to, to advance in terms of uh, uh, decarbonizing agriculture in general and, and uh, methane in particular. But what I really think, and, and uh, you have referred to my, 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 my life in research and then in, 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 uh, in, uh, in, uh, in DG agriculture, I still feel there is, a, there, is a, there is a huge gap. I just come from a, from a meeting where I've discussed with our colleagues from DG Research, how can we have better deployment, and the GRC is also represented deployment. And the, language, the, the message I've got is, yeah, the research results are in a shelf. They are here. Now it's up to you to take them. Uh, that is very interesting, but it's a little bit more complicated, I'm afraid. Firstly, you have already to ensure that when you are doing research, uh, practitioners and those who have to deploy it are involved, I think, and this is what we increasingly do. But what I see in our daily activities, look at the common agriculture policy. <clears throat> you have to design eco-schemes, you have to design, or member states have to design eco-schemes, agri-environmental measures. And they had to do it now again for this CAP reform. So, and uh, I think our colleague, she's from the ministry, I understood, from the Irish. Uh, the colleague who was... We have was colleagues it? online from the Irish yes. ministry. Uh, she was, okay. But anyhow, so, so the question is, if you look at, at the ministry who has to draw up funding schemes for, uh, for making the, the, the agriculture more sustainable, who looks at best practices 
which are in the shelf. They are all here in the shelf somewhere. It might be a virtual shelf. But who is looking at these things and translating it in new funding schemes? If you are a civil servant, you have three weeks to design a funding scheme, what do you do? You take the old one and you add left and right some more conditions and, and the stuff is done. But I think that is, that is our challenge, firstly, on the level of, of, of policy making, and this is true for, for the European Commission in, in the same manner. But then you, have, then you have the funding scheme. But this does still not ensure you that farmers take them up, because as we have said, we are working with incentives, at least in the common agriculture policy. If we go towards more legislation, you see what happens. We did it now with pesticides. Everybody is crying, no, 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 no legislation. Please, pay, please provide incentives. So, so uh, <clears throat> it also requires, and I think there you see very strong differences in member states. I think the Irish is a good model. They have a very uh, 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 comprehensive advice for farmers. And I think it came again clear through the presentation which I have seen. And this is what we also try in the new common agricultural policy through this new uh, ACI system. I always forget what this uh, abbreviation is about. It's agriculture, knowledge, and innovation, uh, something. Uh, agriculture, knowledge, and innovation system. Which, which is indeed to sp spread all these things. But it's a huge task to ensure that 7 to 10 million farmers are always up to take. And then I think then the point from Thomas Duffy comes in on the generational renewal. I mean, it's good that you have all this in the shelf, you have no funding, but at the end you need to have a farmer that does all these things. So, and this is why I think also when we are discussing transition in agriculture and everybody agrees that we need to become more sustainable, I, am, I personally feel that sometimes we overestimate the speed of the change and, and the need to have transitions. But evidently, you can argue, we have no time because the challenges which we are facing, they are so pressing that I cannot wait until you have made up your mind to, to change your practices. So, yeah. now it's to the rest of the panel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah, Pablo? Yes, I, I would like to, um, to mention that I, not, not to offend anyone at all, but I think we do have a problem with science and it's not that we are doing bad science in the science that we are doing, but we are not doing enough multidisciplinary science. I am talking as a rangeland ecologist, as Frank has introduced me, because we are not putting on the table the, the role of, uh, of domestic livestock as herbivores in the world's ecosystems. And this is important because if we recap, uh, the IPCC in the mid 90s, a quarter of a century already from now, decided not to, uh, in, not to do inventories on the natural emissions because it was considered that it would not affect the measures taken in each sector or in, in each uh, productive sector. Uh, but uh, along this quarter of a century, we have seen that um, this comparison between different production systems are mushrooming and are actually triggering decisions uh, from switching from one uh, production system to the other. And this is relevant. This is relevant because when we analyze the terrestrial ecosystems from an, from an ecosystem point of view, from an ecological point of view, uh, we see that when we abandon the most extensive, the most grass-based productions, and uh, we may do that because these are the ones that are producing more methane, uh, at the expense of having a larger fossil fuel footprint, um, we are actually not abating methane emissions, or at least not as much as we would think. And uh, in the Bass Center for Climate Change, we are working on data on that, and we are having preliminary data already that we presented a month ago in Dublin. And uh, what we are concluding is that the amount of methane that is produced naturally in ecosystems is not negligible. So you cannot do policy uh, just assuming that all methane emissions from livestock are anthropogenic, because at least a very significant portion of them are natural and are not going to be abated with changes uh, from, from one uh, productive system to the other. 
And uh, this is not only relevant in the context of common agricultural policy, but this is also very relevant for uh, development policies. And because we are having at the at the global methane footprint, we are having a large portion of it coming from uh, African states and from South Asia, uh, which are uh, systems that are of very low productivity, but very dependent on ecosystem productivity and with very low inputs. And it's precisely there where we have more conserved guilds of uh, wild herbivores that would substitute these domestic herbivores in the case that we go for a policy option implying abandonment and uh, intensification of livestock production, which, by the way, is an option that many African countries are, are proposing as a development strategy and also as a greenhouse gas mitigation strategy. And I consider that uh, a big problem. Of course, I insist not in the science that has been done so far, but in the interpretation, the political interpretation that is given to, to that science. We have to understand also that uh, the levels of natural herbivores in ecosystems are much higher than, than usually perceived and that at the global scale are probably at the same range, the, the potential biomass of natural herbivores with the current biomass of uh, wild herbivores and, and domestic herbivores combined, which also opens an, an optimistic window, I think, for, for sustainable livestock uh, practices, because it means that if we are going to switch to much more sustainable livestock systems, which, which we really badly need, we are not going to affect the the um, the methane footprint and the greenhouse gas footprint in that sense i like more to talk about the huge effect that uh, greenhouse gas emissions by uh, by livestock have on the greenhouse gas effect but not necessarily on the anthropogenically mediated climate change because we really badly need to discern between these two processes Thank Thanks, Pablo. Uh, John, do you want to comment? Because uh, we talk a lot about policy. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure I do. Um, I, was just li <laughs> I was listening. Very interesting to Pablo's um, uh, discussion point there, which I, I agree with. I think uh, the importance of, of multidisciplinary teams and the importance of, of understanding uh, both um, natural or wild and domesticated herbivores, very, very important. One question I, I do have, and this is possibly one that Michelle could answer. Um, we, we talk about methane as if all methane is the same, but a very significant proportion of the methane in the atmosphere is from fossil fuels, which is from carbon dioxide that was sequestered out of the atmosphere millions, hundreds of millions of years ago compared with biogenic methane, which was sequestered from the atmosphere 10 years ago, they surely should be treated differently, Michelle. I'm just, sorry, that was a question rather than a statement. So perhaps, um, we, that, well, yeah, exactly. did you want me to, shall I answer? Um, yes, 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 that's what I was, was going to ask of. Michelle, go, please. Yeah, so, um, I mean, in terms of um, the science and the metrics, we do have, there are different values for the different metrics for fossil or biogenic sources of methane. So in the IPCC report, it'll, uh, the latest one actually has a, a row in the table for fossil and a row for biogenic. So the fossil methane is slightly higher and it is actually only when you're looking at the, um, in terms of say GWP 100, which is looking at the additional energy in the system over a hundred years, I think it's like uh, what it's only about one bigger, so it's like 29 or 30 or um, some, something like that. I can't remember the exact numbers off the top of my head. Um, so there's a small impact because you are bringing in a, that methane is coming to the atmosphere anew and then it degrades to a, an additional CO2. Whereas the biogenic, we account for the fact that the, we're taking one molecule of CO2 from the atmosphere and converting it to methane temporarily, and then it's going back. So that's accounted for in the metrics. Um, and I think really for, in terms of thinking about how it's treated, that's, you know, in terms of policies, there, there may be an argument for, 
you know, I'm sure, sure there is a, a could be a solid argument for treating them separately. I know you treat them separately, like you mentioned in New Zealand. Um, and so, you know, I think it's perfectly reasonable to to say fossil methane, we don't want to be adding any more fossil fuels to the atmosphere. So get that to net zero or zero um, and biogenic methane, you know, have a, di have a different target um, and li like's been done in New Zealand. And I think that's a perfectly reasonable um, approach. Frank, you had a comment or a question? It's a, a comment and a question and, and maybe for you, Michelle, but um, first of all, Wolfgang, your, your comments, I think, about the need to take the, the technology and the papers and the scientific papers down off the shelf and turn them into um, actual practical application and schemes uh, is really important. And, and as scientists, we often try to get everything perfect and, you know, have have um, years and years of research behind us and, and in some sense we don't really have the time but I think there is still a, a big body of scientific work that shows we can make some progress on reducing methane emissions both through breeding and through, um, through feed additives or through dietary means. But we're, we're, we're certainly not going to eliminate um, uh, methane emissions. And yet, you know, the, the first um, slide we, we had from our uh, representative from DG Climate this morning showed the, the trajectory for EU greenhouse gas emissions out to 2050 when we reached climate neutrality. And it showed that um, for agriculture, you know, we, and, and even, you know, we might try to get here by 2035 or soon after, we want to balance all the emissions by removals of CO2. But we're doing that on the, that effectively means, you know, saying we want to eliminate CO, uh, methane emissions or whatever is left, we want to balance it by residual CO2. And is that not like, is that not a kind of a fundamental flaw in, in what we're doing? Because, um, Michelle, you, you, you talk that we, we, if we can reduce methane by a couple of percent per year, we will have neutralized its climate warming effect. Like, to, to kind of go beyond that and, and, and in some hypothetical way say we have to balance all the emissions of methane by removals of CO2. Um, are we missing that point that, you know, these gases have different trajectories in terms of reaching the, the Paris uh, Agreement and um, that putting CO2 and methane together and trying to neutralize the net emissions of them is, is um, failing to recognize that difference uh, in terms of the endpoints of those two gases. I'm, I'm not asking this very well, Michelle, but you, you probably know what I'm getting at. And would you have any comment on, on, on that, on the, you know, what we're trying to do uh, here in the EU in terms of our, our long-term strategy for agricultural emissions? Yes, I, get, I, I do get your point, um, and I think it's a good one. So um, one thing that I did um, pick up in the presentation earlier um, was so the the notion of climate neutrality and that is uh, a tricky one because there's uh, multiple definitions out there for what climate neutrality means and i think this is at the heart of what um, your point is really so as an example um where we have residual methane emissions and um you know we've re reduced methane emissions as much as possible there are still residual methane emissions because they can't be eliminated entirely now, as you say, if the um, methane emissions are gradually um, reducing year on year, we won't be adding any further global warming. We won't be driving temperatures upwards. We may be, um, if, the, if the decrease in methane emissions is fairly small, maybe only 3% per decade, um, then we'll be propping up temperatures at the same level. Uh, so we'll be keeping um, you know, the methane contributions to global warming relatively stable if if cuts are more rapid than that um then we might be you know coming down from a peak in warming and if you are going to decide to offset those residual methane emissions by in your example removals of co2 somehow um the question is how much co2 do you need to remove for every ton of methane that's emitted each year and that is a very um Good question because CO2 is a cumulative gas whereas methane is short-lived and there's potentially a number of different ways of trying to work this out depending on 
um, what you want to do. Um, so there, there has been, uh, there was a recent paper um, to the the Environmental Commissioner in New Zealand, I've, I've <laughs> the, a report that looked at forestry um, offsetting of methane emissions. Um, so that's a very interesting paper. And um, one, so, so the most simple, um, maybe the default way you might think about offsetting methane emissions would be to say, we'll, we have, uh, you know, our methane emissions, we'll convert it to CO2 equivalent using GWP100, that's the standard metric used. Um, for accounting, and then we'll remove that amount of CO2. And that is in the UK. Um, what the Climate Change Committee um, have done in their, in their future scenarios that they've recommended um, that we take uh, in the UK. Um, and by doing that and reaching net zero in 2050, um, by this accounting method of offsetting on the basis of GWP100, that leads to our contribution to global warming declining over time. So it's, um, they've, they've noted this and they said, because we're offsetting methane emissions by removing CO2, that means we can start to undo our past contributions to global warming. We'll actually be driving temperatures down. So that's, um, you know, the kind of thing that can be explored using um, modeling or different types of metrics to try and look at those implications because there isn't really uh, an easy scientific answer um, to, to how do you do this? It really does depend what your end goal is, whether you want to be, you know, leading to temperatures going down over time or keeping them stable at a particular chosen level. So sorry, that was rather a uh, rambling answer perhaps, but it is, a, I think it is a, a complex topic um, because of the different timescales that the different gases um, affect the climate system on. John wants to. John, do you want to to say to add something? Um, oh, I I I, don't, I didn't, um, but I, I might as well. Seeing as I've taken myself off mute, I, look, I agree completely with what Michelle has said there. You're you're moving from a science discussion to an ethics discussion as to as to whether we want to use all of our abilities uh, to um, reduce. Um, reduce past warming, so cause cause a degree of cooling, um, which some would argue possibly gives us a little bit more breathing space in terms of our transition to carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide net zero. Um, but I think it is a, it is a good point, Frank. Um, you know, we are dealing with a, a, a we, we, I think one of the things, and this goes back to Sinead's question of me when I finished speaking, I think one of the confusions here is that people believe that uh, animal proteins have a warming effect and other foods do not. And that's just simply not the case. Many of the, of the plant sources have very large nitrous oxide footprints and depending on whether you account for carbon loss from the soil can have fairly significant carbon dioxide losses as well, not to mention the food waste footprint that tends to come with, with plant foods as well. So it, it is a balance. It is trying to um, find, find the balance between uh, a healthy and sustainable nutrition for the planet and re reducing our warming impact at, at least to zero. And ideally, if we can and we can develop the technologies to do it, why wouldn't we take it to, to, into a cooling phase through reducing methane by more than that? But that is an ethical decision rather than a scientific decision. On this, on this point, as I, as, I, as I said, I think uh, we are certainly uh, open, Frank, to, to sh share any discussion on, on, on what is uh, evidence-based, science evidence-based with respect to, to this methane uh, and the effects of methane with respect to climate change. So if there is new science, if there are new, uh, new concerns that, that uh, should lead the uh, Commission to reconsider its, its, its policies. I think that's a, a fair point, but as I said, I'm, I'm not aware of, of it. So if you have evidence in that respect, I think that is certainly something you should also share with our colleagues from DG Climate. But I would like to, to come back on the point of uh, Pablo. 
which seems to me a, a, a very fair point. And if I understood him correctly, uh, he, is, uh, he is concerned that extensive uh, livestock farming systems uh, are abandoned because they are not green enough, in fact. In particular, if you look at the CO2 emissions and methane emissions. And I think he has a, he has a very fair point, and it's, it's one of my, my really favorite topics, because we are facing now discussions about what food, which food, and I think that's the same for Bell, which food is green? What is green? Who can claim green? And I personally have a concern that the most intensive production, which looks at the uh, life cycle uh, of, of, a, of, a, of a product, might end up to be the greenest compared to what I, my emotions and uh, with me, I think many citizens out there expect if you have extensive farming in whatever mountain areas or wherever, this is what you should do. But then you are told, you listen, but the methane goes directly up to, to, to heaven, uh, no, to heaven, yeah. Uh, the, 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 the other excrements go directly to water. So this is the worst thing you can do. So, but what about biodiversity? What about landscapes? What, what about all these other externalities? So, what I feel so extremely difficult in, as a person uh, to see that even amongst all these green objectives, there are trade-offs. Trade-offs between uh, uh, methane, biodiversity, animal welfare, uh, you call it. And who of, of those guys is right to say, I am green? Because I think the worst thing is, if you, if you say to a consumer, green is the most intensive production because you capture everything in, in your stable. And at the same time, the organic farmer says also, I am also green. So, I mean, at one point in time, consumers probably have a problem that, that whatever you do in production methods, everybody claims green because they look at different indicators. So just, just uh, what I feel in terms of, of uh, <coughs> public debate in which we are now in this context of uh, also labeling and sustainable food systems, we, we, we face all these discussions. And I personally, uh, because everybody, looks at sustainability. In, if you look in the commission, the DG Sante looks at it from the health side, human health side. DG Environment looks at it from the environmental side, DG Climate from the climate side, we look at it from the agricultural side. So, so who, who now uh, has the definition of what is a sustainable food system? And, and you can break it down on livestock. What is a sustainable livestock system, in fact? This summer, I, I was in a farm in Austria. Everything automized, digitalized, <laughs> perfect, if you ask me. But then I asked him, but what about uh, your, your, your cattle grazing? Oh, it doesn't graze, it's happier here, but I still have enough surface to, to cut the grass and to feed the grass with some complements. So is, is this the right thing for the future, or is it... I, I, I find it very difficult to, to, to find my way in, this, in these discussions, in fact. Huh? Yes, we had to wrap up, but we have John and Paolo uh, raising hands. So I, we don't see who was first, but uh, yeah, John or Pablo? Okay, pa sorry. Pa 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 Pablo was first. <laughs> mute. Pablo, you are mute. <laughs> Yeah, I, I lowered a hand and then I forget to switch on the microphone. I wanted to say that um, the, the challenge has been indeed for a very long time that we had this balance between biodiversity, between a positive effect on biodiversity and a negative effect on climate. But I insist that this research line that we are opening at the Bass Center for Climate Change is really interesting because, for example, we have... Uh, we have just finished, and it's it's in the process of publication, but it's in a in a preprint. We have finished 
a study on transhuman systems in Spain, because in Spain there is still long distance transhumans that allows us to do this kind of, of analysis. And we have found out that their footprint, um, not including what we sh should subtract from, from uh, what uh, um, natural herbivores would emit, but just the footprint of, of transhuman farms is comparable to the footprint, the carbon footprint or the carbon equivalent footprint of um, intensive sheep farms. Okay. And why? Because uh, in, in these type of systems that are the ones that are by far more valuable from a biodiversity point of view, uh, you are having high productivity because the, the animals are grazing on, on green grass all year long. They are not suffering from extreme temperatures. They are having high fertility. They are having long lives. They are having uh, a good uh, animal welfare. So I think this is very important to highlight because we are envisioning that there is, there is not a trade-off there. We do have systems that are sustainable from all three axes of sustainability. Okay, and, and even in the environmental sustainability from the biodiversity point of view, from the nutrient pollution point of view, from the carbon footprint point of view, and more so if we include that baseline natural emissions that I was talking about. So I know that this is a new research line and we are basically the only ones working on that, but this is important and I think it deserves attention. John? Yeah, I just wanted to touch on the other point that Wolfgang brought up, um, um, asking about whether there was new science and and that that should be brought forward to policymakers. Um, I don't, I mean, it's not, it depends on how, what your time scale is. I don't think it's new science anymore. And it's, it's largely accepted that biogenic methane has a, has a shorter life than either carbon dioxide or nitrous oxide, and therefore has a different impact on the warming of the atmosphere. Um, in New Zealand, our policy decision was rather than argue over what metrics should be used, we separated methane out from the other two and that allows us to have a different target for it. And I think that has been a very sensible approach as was in one of Michelle's, I think, concluding slides. Um, so that we will meet, or we have every commitment of meeting our Paris obligations, um, but we don't have to get methane to net zero to do that. We will get carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide to net zero, and we will reduce methane by the amount that is needed to ensure that it is not further warming. So I'm not sure if that was if that um, deals with with that comment, Wolfgang. I, I don't think it's new science. It's been around now for several years, and Michelle and and her colleagues have done a fantastic job in in bringing that forth and explaining how it improves our ability to model atmospheric warming. Um, and our our approach to that, rather than arguing over the metrics, has been to split those gases so that they can be treated separately. I have to ask, Thomas, are you still there? Because uh, we would like to perhaps have a final comment from the farming, uh, the young farmers' uh, uh, perspective. Uh, I mean, all these thinking, thoughts and uh, proposals without taking into account farmers are not very uh, um, suitable. So please, if you can make a final comment, it would be great. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I, I, it's it's great to get a final comment uh, because I think often the worlds of research, the worlds of policy, and and the worlds of practical farming are often too far apart. And, and exactly as as Wolfgang has has mentioned, there challenges taking down the research from the the shelf, uh, and then certainly implementing it in national policy. But then often there is a big challenge in terms of knowledge transfer, um, and and getting that implemented on the farm. Uh, I think certainly the, the conversation around methane has been very confusing uh, for a, a lot of farmers, both domestically and international. Um, there's, a, there's a very big challenge in terms of, of reducing that. As I often come back to uh, international researchers like uh, Michael E. Mann uh, have been very clear that the first thing we need to do is get fossil fuels down. That doesn't mean that, that we have a free ride uh, in agriculture. Um, and certainly farmers, we need to both feel and i think to come back to something that sinead waters actually said about the the um the negative 
that's very much focused on. And that's exactly what Pablo is, has been getting at as well. The very negative perception that farming has been getting when really we have a very large role that we can play um, uh, both as an enabling factor and also uh, as emissions reductions to have a, a, a long term and a, incorporate all the aspects of uh, the environment into a more sustainable, much as I think that word is overused, but a, a, a true, more sustainable food system. Thank you, Thomas. So, unfortunately, we need to wrap up. Um, yes, Frank, yes. you agree? <laughs> so, um, it, it, of course, this conversation is, is just starting. Um, it is clear that we need to at least try to get a definition of what we mean by sustainable food systems. Um, and this would be eventually one <coughs> key starting point also. So maybe this is something that ATF will also put forward in a, in a close future. Um, and we need to keep in mind that this definition should account for the fact that we need to feed a growing population. Uh, I think it was John that started with, with, the, with the, you know, the curve that we all know. Um, so we also need to feed ourselves <laughs> because it's lunchtime. We thank all the partners and the people that were participating and also the speakers. And Frank, I hand it over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Anna and Anna, for moderating that session. So, look, I'm not going to give a, a long summing up. I think we've had a very good um, seminar this morning. Um, and thanks for everyone for attending, both those in the room and the large number of people who are online. I think, you know, both from Wolfgang's comments about the um, submissions that uh, he has received, and also from our first speaker, Colin Markey's uh, MEP, his um, comments around the way the debate can be framed in the, the parliament from, from different groups shows that, you know, this is, a, I suppose, livestock's role is very contested now. And, um, and look, that's a challenge for us. But at the same time, I think we, we have come a long way in the debate. And, you know, we have everybody, I think, um, all the actors, uh, the farmers, the, the scientists, the policy makers, I think all kind of on, on the one page in terms of um, uh, f agreeing that we need uh, to, to address the, the emissions from livestock. Okay, some people might say the way to address that is get rid of livestock, which a lot of us would, would disagree with, but I think there's at least agreement that we have to address the, the sustainability of the, of the system. I think that the whole issue around methane is really important, and, um, uh, and I think we, you know, we're at a very important point now. The, the EU is, is firming up its Fit for 55 proposals. Uh, that's going to set the framework really for how uh, the, the, the community will deal with this issue for, for you know, the next decade or, or more. And, um, you know, without labouring the point, I think it's very clear that um, CO2 emissions have to be got down to net zero as quickly as possible. It's also very clear that methane emissions don't have to be got down to net zero. Um, and the, the types of figures that uh, Michelle showed from the IPCC scenarios that a reduction somewhere of the order of 50% by 2050 would, um, would be a, a, a contribution towards the, the Paris uh, targets. So, so really what, what I would think in the European community we need to be offsetting uh, from our CO2 removals is not all the methane, uh, but half the methane. And that makes a huge difference uh, to how agriculture in the European community, and in, in particular in my own country, uh, might develop over the, the coming decades. So we really have to, it's, as John said, Wolfgang, it's not new science, it's how we actually take on board this science. And some of it is, is judgment, you know, it's not, there isn't a scientific answer as to whether it should be a 50% target for methane by, by 2050 or a 30% or, or whatever it is. So, so this is where policymakers and scientists and society need to work together to see what is the appropriate target. But it's really fundamental uh, to how livestock um, farming is going to develop uh, over the next couple of decades. And I think the approach in New Zealand uh, does offer us an exemplar uh, to look at at least and see, well, how is another 
uh, country dealing with this, this particular issue. Another country that has a lot of expertise of working uh, with methane and, you know, where it's a very important gas in, in your basket of greenhouse gases as well. So, so I think there's a, a, a really strong debate that should be based on the science needed over, over the, the coming year or two in relation to that. I think the, the very positive thing that came out from, from today from several of our speakers um, is that, yes, there are options to reduce livestock methane. Uh, some of them are, you know, being deployed at the moment, whether it's, you know, breeding through improved efficiency or more advanced breeding to directly or, or indirectly reduce uh, methane. Um, we see the feed additives and, and that, you know, kind of at the, the, the cusp, as we describe it, you know, they're, they're coming out the end of the pipeline, the research pipeline, and they're into that kind of deployment phase now. And I think it's really important over the next couple of years that we, we figure out how are we going to deploy and use these great technologies that have been developed through, through research, both in the, the public and the private sector. How are we going to use them now to solve this big problem and this big conundrum, I suppose, that society has in relation to uh, food production on the one hand and greenhouse gas emissions on, on the other. Um, I think it's very clear that uh, we need multi-actor and multidisciplinary approaches to that. You know, it cannot, it, it cannot just be the scientists in the laboratory or it cannot be, be, be just left up to the private sector. I think we need that multi-actor approach and the need for multidisciplinary approach and multidisciplinary research around this is very, very clear. And um, we don't have a lot of time, you know, 2030, which is kind of our next big landing point in terms of targets is, is only eight years away. So um, that's a very short time in terms of research and technology deployment. So the, the support for farmers in relation to adopting technologies uh, quickly as they come out of this research pipeline is going to be critical, I think, uh, in terms of, of seeing progress being made. And there's a huge role, I agree with you, Wolfgang, then for, for policymakers and for the, the common agricultural policy and, and the design of the, the schemes and that to support that adoption uh, by, by farmers. And we're very lucky in the EU that we, we do have uh, the ability to support ski, uh, to support technologies or to support changes of system through the, the common agricultural policy. So I think that's um, that was really all I wanted to say in terms of the, the messages that came fr from today. We will produce a policy brief on this, which I think will be quite an important policy brief, and we will take that to your, your colleagues um, in, in the Commission, in DG Climate and elsewhere. Um, so that, that will be the output from, from today. I'd like to thank very much all our, our speakers, those online and those that were in, in person here, um, for contributing to a really worthwhile session. And we, we greatly valued your, your contributions and, and your expertises. Um, I'd also like to thank my, my colleagues. Uh, sorry, also, I think I mentioned the speakers that were here, including yourself, Wolfgang, and, 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 and many others that were here, and some of my own colleagues and all, all of you, both online and in-person speakers. I'd like to thank my colleagues um, in the Animal Task Force, uh, Anna Granados and Anna Santos, and uh, Giuseppe B, who could not be here today. They're the three uh, vice presidents of the Animal Task Force for, for helping uh, to prepare and to deliver uh, this seminar. And I think most of all, I would like to thank um, uh, Susanna de Magdale, our, um, the, the bedrock, I don't know what to describe you at this stage, Susanna, because you're doing a lot more than providing the administrative uh, function for the Animal Task Force. And we really uh, greatly appreciate the huge amount of work you've put in over the last couple of months in order to ensure that we were able to have this seminar here today. Uh, so I think a big round of applause to, to Susanna. <laughs> So the last thing that we're going to benefit from Susanna's organisation now is lunch. She has organised lunch for us just outside the door and I know it will be a very nice lunch and uh, a very low carbon lunch I'm sure as well, but um, uh, uh, still a nice tasty lunch with a good mixture of, um, of uh, food products in that, both animal and plant based. So or thank you all very much and uh, we'll see you all again next year, please God. very much.